Okay, good evening, everybody. Welcome to our chapter meeting here in the Ken Keltner chapter. Uh, we're really thrilled to have Andy McHugh here this evening. He's going to be doing his, uh, uh, an encore performance, I like to call it, of a Sabre 50 presentation um, called The First Ball Four Saga, The Seattle Pilots' Journey to Bankruptcy. I have to admit, one of the reasons this was the first thing I had on my list to do when I got back from the convention is I got into a conversation while this was going on. Next thing I knew, I completely missed it. So I had to find a way to see the presentation. So I thought I'd call Andy and see if we could do it as a chapter meeting and let everybody see it. So, so uh, uh, my bad planning actually may work out for everyone. So, so welcome, Andy, and thank you for showing up. Well, happy to do it, Bob. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let me give you a real quick uh, um, bio on Andy. He's currently a, a, a researcher and writer. Uh, he's been a member of Sabre since 1982. For those of you who don't want to do the math, yes, that's 40 years. Um, he was a Sabre board member from 2002 through 2011, president for the last two years of that term. Um, he has, he's been involved in four books, uh, Stumbling Around the Bases, The American Legion. You want to put the book up, Andy, since I don't have the cover on mine. The American oh, Legion, okay. Mismanagement of the Expansion Era. Uh, we will have a drawing tonight from everybody who's uh, signed in on this to uh, get a copy of this book. Uh, he co-edited, and oh, I'm, well, before that, then he had the award-winning Mover and Shaker, Walter O'Malley, The Dodgers, and Baseball's Westward, Westward Expansion. Oh, let me let somebody else in here. Um, uh, and that was the, that won the Seymour Medal, I believe. Was that correct? Yes, in 2015. Yep. And then he co-edited Endless Seasons Baseball in Southern California. And then another award-winning book, Baseball by the Books, A Complete History and Bibliography of Baseball Fiction. And that was the Sabre Baseball Research Award back in 1986. Right. Yep. Okay, cool. Plus, he's been on a number of uh, chapters in Sabre books, projects, and other publications. Uh, I mentioned that he won the Seymour he won the uh, McMillan Sabre Baseball Research Award, and he won the Biggie in 2007, the Bob Davids Award, uh, which is Sabre's highest honor for research and service to the organization. So kind of, a, I'm hearing. And I avoided some bicycles. And then this, this uh, the I'm gonna, motorized. I'm going to mute. I'm muting everybody. Andy, you'll probably have to unmute yourself. Uh, when we get started. Um, so I'm ready. I've got two questions for you, Andy, and then you can start on your presentation. So if you'd unmute yourself, I'll maybe you have. I did. Okay. So the first question, um, uh, stealing this from all kinds of people who asked this question, what is your earliest baseball memory? Oh, wow. Um, it's actually at, at Yankee Stadium. Um, we had, my mother was from New York. And uh, we had gone back over Easter vacation in 1957 to see my grandmother. And uh, my father took me to, uh, to Yankee Stadium. Uh, in retrospect, I wished he'd taken me to Ebbets Field, but he, <laughs> he took me, to, uh, he took me to, uh, to Yankee Stadium. And I, uh, I have this, that classic memory that probably lots of you have. You're in the, you know, you're in the subway. You're coming up these dark stairways. You're going into this dark stadium down a tunnel. And all of a sudden, whammo, you get that spread of bright, bright green spread out around you. And so that, that is my first, uh, my first baseball memory was just going to that game uh, of seeing, uh, seeing my father confused at the ticket stand when the, uh, when the ticket guy asked him if he wanted to sit in the mezzanine and he had no idea which part of the stadium was the mezzanine. So when you're not, you know, when you're eight years old, you're not used to your father being confused. He supposedly knows everything at that point. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, uh, that was part of the memory uh, game that I could, I could remember uh, just enough about it that I could find it on retro sheet 30 years later. Uh, so that was kind of, kind of fun as well. Neat. And then the second question is, if you could have a timeshare, time, timeshare, uh, a time machine moment, what baseball event or person would you want to go back and see? 
I would love to see Hannes Wagner. Wow. Um, all of the descriptions of, of his skills and of the way he moved really uh, intrigue me. Uh, that, that, that whole era is interesting. But uh, especially Wagner, the, the skill levels he demonstrated and also the, the description of him, you know, bow-legged, long arms, all of that kind of thing. I, I really wish I could have seen him play. Interesting. I, 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 I can agree with that one. I like that one a lot. Okay, well, if you'd like to uh, share your screen and we can start the presentation. Okay. Uh, for those of you who've been to Sabre, present, uh, Sabre conventions, the 25 minute uh, presentation limit is not applying here today. We can, he can add to it and we can, uh, so it can go longer than that. So, so enjoy. Okay. Hang on a second there. All right, are, are you, is everybody seeing this looking like a normal PowerPoint presentation on the screen? I can see it, yep. Okay, good, good. Um, well, uh, the, the, the title kind of uh, speaks for itself. Uh, I suspect everyone here has read uh, Ball Four at one time or another. And uh, if you haven't, you probably should. It's a very funny book. And it's also, uh, it's a very good kind of meditation on the uncertainties of the major league ball player's life and what might happen to him uh, tomorrow, depending upon performance. So, uh, and it's interesting that for those of you who aren't card collectors, the one on the right is from the 1970 top set when of course there weren't any Seattle pilots anymore, uh, but uh, that was too late, too late for tops to do anything about it. Too late for an awful lot of people to uh, uh, change and make their arrangements for the 1970 season, but uh, we'll get to that. Let's start with, uh, the reason for all of this, which began in 1958 when the Giants and the Dodgers moved to California, uh, creating an enormous gap in attendance uh, between the two leagues. At that point, they had gone, oh, for probably 30 years back and forth, uh, two or three years, the American League would have more people than two or three years, the National League. They were, they were pretty close. And... Um, it, it traded places all the time. Then all of a sudden, the National League had this huge advantage. And um, the, the expansion era was in part, um, in great part, uh, designed to try and get rid of that gap. The first step was in 61. And you'll see there they made some modest progress. Uh, they had a team in Los Angeles. But of course, first of all, it was an expansion team, which meant it wasn't very good or particularly interesting. And the Dodgers were simply uh, the hottest thing in town at that point. Um, they had come, they had kind of uh, anointed Los Angeles as a major league city, which it felt it wanted to be. Um, they had won the World Series in 1959. They were a, a very big ticket. Uh, Hollywood loved them. And so um, the Angels didn't have the impact that the American League hoped for. So they, um, they were still, as the 60s progressed, they were still looking for ways to, to cut that gap. And eventually they would get what they thought might be their answer with Charlie Finley. Okay, now they had already, uh, at this point, Charlie had wanted to move to Louisville. He had wanted to move to Dallas, Fort Worth. Um, they had made it clear once by a formal vote, once by kind of, uh, job owning him that he was not going to get that permission. But all of a sudden, Charlie says that he wants to move to Oakland. And so they see a way that maybe they can calm Charlie down and also cut into that gap between their between attendance on the West Coast. Now, th this does work somewhat for the American League, but it doesn't work particularly well for the A's or for baseball as a whole. You'll see on the left of this graph, the first 10 years in San Francisco for the Giants, and they averaged 1.5 million. The next 10 years, the two teams together, the A's and the Giants, and let's remember the A's had some terrific teams in the early 70s, very interesting teams and good teams, World Series winners, and yet the annual average between the two teams is only 1.56 million. As the National League had suggested at the time, uh, 
because they were protecting the Giants' interest. The Bay Area at that point was really just not big enough to handle two teams uh, as it is today. So um, again, this was another attempt by them to get into, uh, to cut that gap between the two leagues. But they also knew that there were gonna be <clears throat> uh, reverberations from allowing Finley to move. They had just watched the National League have to defend a lawsuit in court about the, uh, they're allowing the Braves to move from Milwaukee to Atlanta. Uh, the National League had won that lawsuit, but um, nobody was particularly happy about that result. So when they went to the meetings where they were going to approve Finley's move from Kansas City to Oakland, they invited a Kansas City delegation and they promised that delegation that they were going to get an expansion team. They thought it was going to be in 1972, but the, the Kansas City people threatened lawsuits. Stuart Symington, the Missouri senators, threatened their antitrust exemption in the Senate. And so they caved in and agreed that Kansas City would be without Major League Baseball only for 1968 there would be an expansion team in 1969. Now, none of this had been discussed with the National League, despite a formal agreement between the two leagues that neither would expand without talking to the other and discussing all of the issues like, um, you know, the World Series and um, uh, broadcast contracts and player pools and the amateur draft. Um, and so that, that had to be worked out and eventually uh, the National League would go along very reluctantly. They really didn't want to expand in 1969, but they did. So the question then becomes where? They have already committed to Kansas City. Where is the other team going to be? And so both leagues are basically looking at this list. Um, and as you'll see, the National League grabs off the, the most attractive team and also takes another in San Diego, a smaller market on the West Coast. Um, the American League uh, looks at this list and um, has various, uh, various issues. They, they are not particularly interested in, in Toronto. Um, they again bypassed Dallas-Fort Worth, uh, even though it was wide open to them. Uh, Roy Hoffines, uh, owner of the Astros, was very happy with the media revenue he was getting out of the Dallas-Fort Worth market um, and didn't want another team in there. So the National League was not going to go in there. It was wide open for the American League. Uh, they didn't take it. They settled on Seattle in part because there were two uh, other cities under consideration which might provide some attendance for Seattle. Neither was, if both of them were far enough away that you probably weren't going to go there for just one game, but you might go for a weekend or something like that. So they offered some, some uh, potential possibilities. Now, this is kind of a, an interesting uh, graph that shows the difference in uh, perception of uh, the two leagues at that point. Uh, the pilots and uh, the Royals would pay a flat franchise, flat franchise fee of $100,000 and then they'd have to buy 30 wonderful players at $175,000 a piece for a total of 5.3 million. The Padres and the Expos would have to pay a franchise fee of $4 million um, and uh, then buy 30 players at the slightly higher price of 200,000 a piece. So the total cost for a National League franchise was 10 million, almost twice as much as an American League franchise. Um, so that was that kind of told you what what people thought about the differences between the the two leagues at that point. Now it was estimated. This is the kind of estimate that would show up in in the sporting news. That in addition to the to the cost they were going to have to pay the other owners, uh, the other American League owners, the expansion teams were going to have all of these other costs, which meant that a franchise was basically going to cost them a seven million dollars. And I put that in a red because I want you to kind of file that number away in the, in the back of your mind uh, as, as we go farther along in the saga here. So now the question becomes, what are they going to do in Seattle? The president of the American League is Joe Cronin, who, to my mind, 
is kind of a uh, a symbol of the Peter Principle. Uh, the guy is an all-star shortstop. He is a he's a decent manager uh, with the Red Sox in the '40s. He's really not a very good general manager of the Red Sox in the '50s, and he's a disaster as the American League president in the '60s into the into the '70s. He just kept getting promoted to uh, the, the level where he really wasn't much good anymore. And he is the guy who has to go to Seattle. Now, the American League in, in, in Kansas City, I should say, they were walking into a situation um, where the ownership prospects were very promising. Uh, Finley had irritated so many people that groups had been forming and coming forward to try and buy the team from Finley or to work out a deal with the city so they could buy the team from Finley. Uh, so those groups had already coalesced. The American League could approach them, um, analyze their, their quality, their balance sheets, uh, their ability to uh, you know, manage a franchise and support a franchise in, in the early years when it wasn't likely to be too successful. And they could finally um, choose Ewing Kaufman and uh, you know, get a, a fairly steady owner out of him. In Seattle, they didn't quite know what to do. Uh, they didn't have the contacts in the business community. Nobody had been coming forward to put a expansion team in Seattle. So they went to the guys that they knew, that Joe Cronin knew. And that was the brothers Soriano, Dewey and Max. Uh, both of them had been star schoolboy pitchers in the Seattle area. Max had pitched at the University of Washington. Um, Duke. Dewey had gone on to have a, uh, a minor league career, mostly in the Pacific Coast League, but also in lower minor leagues, where he actually made the transition to a point where at a team in eastern Washington, he was both uh, the starting, starting pitcher and the general manager. Um, and he did that for several years until Emil Sick, who was the owner of the Seattle franchise in the Pacific Coast League, uh, brought him back uh, to run the front office, first of all, of the farm team in Vancouver, uh, British Columbia, and then of the, uh, uh, the Rainiers themselves in Seattle. And by the early 60s, uh, Dewey had become the president of the Pacific Coast League and therefore had lots of contacts through baseball, including uh, uh, Joe Cronin. And when Cronin got there, it was pretty clear that he was in effect handing the franchise to the Sorianos, saying, here's an opportunity, you put together an ownership group uh, because the Sorianos clearly didn't have the kind of money that they would need to come up with that $7 million all on their own. So uh, the Sorianos go do a little bit around Seattle, trying to round up the money. It's not successful. So they go to their contacts in baseball. In 1964, the Cleveland Indians had examined the possibility of moving to Seattle. Um, they, and the Sorianos at that point had had a lot of contact with Gabe Paul and through him with William Daly, a uh, former owner of the Indians. And they got a hold of Daly and Daly agreed that he would provide and or his friends would provide a good deal of the money that the pilots would need. And when the, when the uh, team was finally put together, this is what the ownership looked like. Daly owned 47%. His cronies in Cleveland owned another 13. And the Sorianos, uh, that was family money that the Sorianos managed to put together. Uh, and they had a few friends in Seattle push some owners. What didn't seem to disturb the American League owners and should have really is to look at the pie chart like this, where the local people own 40% of it and out-of-towners own 60% of the team. Um, and uh, as it had been in Milwaukee uh, just a few years earlier, um, that was a prescription for trouble. And in doing so, I mean, the Sorianos in, in not raising the money that they needed had overlooked um, some large corporate possibilities, not so much maybe in the in the corporation investing itself, but in members of the families that own the corporations or their top executives getting involved. All three of these companies headquartered in Seattle, large companies, and all of them 
would have family members involved in bringing uh, the Seattle Seahawks to Seattle and the NFL just a few years later. But that was not the way Dewey and Max did things. Dewey's quote, this, is, this was a quote he gave to the guy he hired to sell season tickets and advertising and group packages and all of this. So this guy is going to the business community uh, in Seattle, looking for them to get involved with the team as, as super customers in effect. But Dewey is saying, we don't need help from outsiders. Now, there was an interesting study that had been commissioned by the city of Seattle back in 1961. And they asked Stanford Research Institute to look at a number of issues that they saw as coming up in as the city continued to grow um, and to expand. And one of the issues that they raised with Stanford is that um, what are the prospects that we could gain and support Major League Baseball in Seattle? Well, Stanford came back with a, a, a qualified yes. And the yes depended on three, uh, three qualifications. One, they had to have the support of the business community, which they are failing to get here. They had to have the support of the political establishment and the city. And third, they would have to have a major league quality stadium. So as you can see from this, they are not getting the support of the business community. They're doing it uh, through the help of outsiders and through scam, uh, scrambling together uh, family cash. Uh, the big issue as people saw it was the stadium. This is a shot of six stadium, which was the PCL Seattle Rainiers uh, ballpark, um, Emil Sick owned the uh, Rainier Brewery Company and named the team the Seattle Rainiers. It was considered a pretty good park uh, by PCL standards. Some years it was said it could hold more than 11,000. Uh, but basically, uh, you know, it was a, it was a modestly sized uh, uh, Pacific Coast League stadium. Um, now, that was important because the city was going to have to step in to do something about uh, the stadium. And again, hearkening back to that Stanford Research Institute study, the city was not particularly interested. There were five members of the city council. There's the mayor, Dorm Brannan, and a couple of others who were somewhat supportive of the pilots. And there were two members of the city council who felt that the city should not spend one nickel supporting Major League Baseball. The city, uh, both the city council and more important, the kind of business establishment had come together in a program called Forward Thrust. And it was looking to support projects which they felt would help uh, the city grow and become more sophisticated. Um, community centers, libraries, uh, business development projects, and a, a uh, major league quality stadium which could handle both baseball and football. This came to a vote in early 1968, about three or four months after Seattle had been targeted for expansion for 69. And the proposal needed 60% to pass. It was not looking promising. And then uh, the American League organized a kind of cavalcade of people like Mickey Mantle to come in and give speeches and talk up baseball and the stadium proposal was one of six out of these 13 uh, projects that actually did, did pass. So, but at that point, the American League didn't really follow through. They told the city they wanted a stadium that could hold 30,000 people, but they didn't ever sit down and create a document that specified exactly what they wanted, not only in terms of seats, but in terms of quality, of construction, of, of parking and concessions and all of those kind of things. Well, eventually um, the, the city, the, the, it was projected that the whole thing would cost about 2 million. The city said, we don't pay that. We'll only pay so much money. The American League says, well, maybe we can accept 28. And then later, maybe we can accept 25. Um, but the city was just unwilling to put its money on the line and kept uh, dithering about the whole thing. In 
January of 69, three months from the time uh, opening day is to take place in Seattle, uh, the Sorianos are writing to the city saying, hey, nothing has happened. No construction has begun. Uh, no revisions of the, of the current setup have begun. We have got to get going. And the city is simply not energized to do anything about it. Uh, the, the politicians are worried about spending money and clearly are getting very little pressure from their constituents uh, to do anything about it. But eventually they do get around to it. You can see in this somewhat blurry picture that um, they have filled this space down the left field line with seats uh, and they would ring the outfield with seats and a fairly substantial right field bleachers. However, by the time they got to opening day, they had done no more than put the footings for these seats. They had not actually been built um, and they would not get to even this ultimate 23,000 and change uh, until June. Uh, this just wasn't getting done. And when opening day hit, um, there were still uh, a lot of things that needed uh, that needed work. The people who came to sit in the left field bleachers had to wait around while carpenters were finished pounding things together. Uh, as I said, the right field bleachers hadn't even been uh, started, really had any work started on them yet. Um, the, uh, the toilets had not been installed or upgraded. They were using porta potties. Uh, the concessions hadn't been expanded to the point where they could handle um, the increased crowd. Um, uh, the beer ran out down the left field line. It was just um, not, uh, not up to major league standards as Bowie Kuhn said after attending the game. So, uh, and then this would only, only get worse the, uh, when the uh, pilots came home from a road trip in May. Um, the customers stood up after the game and found out that the paint, which had not quite dried, had come off on their clothing. And all of a sudden the pilots are uh, paying dry cleaning bills uh, for this kind of thing. And this is all being played out uh, in the newspapers. The, the, the team is complaining to the city that they are not uh, keeping up with what had been promised. The city is fighting with a contractor about the quality of what's being done. And they're admitting that the quality uh, uh, had been cut back and that uh, so you've got this three-way carnival of the contractors in the city and the team complaining about each other and doing it very very publicly to so their customers are hearing all the time what all of these problems in the stadium were. Now this is being compounded by the stadium that would eventually become the Kingdome. As I said that had been approved in February of 1968 and so it was theoretically giving uh, the pilots fans an opportunity to say, well, our current stadium may not be what we hope, but there's a, there's a good one coming. But almost immediately it fell into a very, um, very local bickering about where this stadium should be located. There were two, two sites, one where the kingdom was eventually built and another one less than a mile away. And people were fighting about that. So you've got these fans who are being told frankly, that the stadium you can go to now is a dump and that the one that they were hoping to get is years and God knows how much bickering away. And it would take uh, seven more years uh, before that stadium opened. So you're discouraging, you're discouraging your customers in effect. Opening day, they get 15,000. They'd hoped for a million and figured that break even would be 850, but in June, they go to the accounting department and get told they're heading for a $2.2 million loss. And by the end of the season, um, attendance doesn't even hit 700,000. Um, so the, the Sorianos decide it's time they're going to get out. And on October 11th, they reach an agreement to sell to a Milwaukee group, eventually Brewers ownership, for $10.8 million, which the Sorianos feel um, was enough to make them whole. Now, this isn't publicly announced, but word starts to get around 
these are, of course, the people you guys are especially familiar with who would be the backbone in the early years of the franchise. There was money from Schlitz and from Herb Cole's family in the department store. And I think maybe from the, there was another uh, big participant in that. Actually, Dennis knows more about this than I do. He's been researching the ownership. Um, but uh, these were the main players. And knowing this, even though, as I said, it hadn't been formally announced, local groups start to step forward to try and stave uh, the franchise for the city. Uh, the two people who were most public about this are a guy named Fred Dans, who owned um, movie theaters and other entertainment venues in the city, and uh, Dave Cohn, who was a uh, restaurateur. Well, the American League doesn't want uh, the Mariners to move. They're already dealing, uh, they had watched the National League uh, deal with the Milwaukee situation. They had tried to head off the Kansas City situation and apparently had done so, but they knew that if they tried to, uh, if, the, if the team left Seattle, that they'd have problems with uh, the local authorities in Seattle as well. So they very quickly approve uh, the Dan's Cone Group uh, for ownership of the pilots. Trying to, trying to keep the team in, uh, in Seattle. But by the end of January, it's clear that the dance group is failing to raise the money. Okay, now this is, uh, the, partially this is because the Dan's and Cohn didn't have a terrific amount of money on their own, kind of like the Sorianos. And their plan was that they were going to sell season ticket packages. They felt they had the connections in the Seattle business community to do that kind of thing and raise the money that would be needed. However, it's suddenly revealed by the Sorianos that in the course of putting together the ownership group for the team, they had borrowed $3.5 million. I remember it, remember that figure of 7 million. They had borrowed three and a half million dollars of that. They had not told the American League. The American League had not insisted on really understanding how the, uh, the equity of the franchise was put together, how much of it was borrowed, how much of it was cash, anything. So all of a sudden, the, the Dan's Cone Group has to raise an additional three and a half million dollars, and that's just too much. So the American League owners are backing away from the Dan's Cone Group because it's just not going to work. And a third guy, Edward Carlson, who'd been working with Dan's and Cone, uh, he was the head of a local uh, a locally headquartered hotel chain. He would eventually become the, the chairman of United Airlines. Um, but he suggests that they do a community ownership deal uh, similar to what the, the uh, Green Bay Packers have. Um, and, but that's, um, he, he is rapidly shot down by a number of owners with Charlie Finley leading the way saying, basically, this isn't the way we do business. We are motivated by profits, and we have one person who is responsible for the franchise, and community ownership does not match that possibility. So the Carlson Group walks away. Now, the American League owners realize that they can't just leave the situation it is, so they agree they will loan uh, the Sorianos uh, $650,000 and that will tide them through uh, spring training. It will get the season going, and then they can uh, hopefully uh, have a better attendance record and recoup their operations in 1970, and things will work out. But things are just real unsettled. And so the various government bodies, Seattle, uh, eventually King County, in which Seattle is located, and the state of Washington, um, Sioux Baseball, just kind of. It, it has the effect of, of uh, putting some pressure on them, of, of letting them know what's going to happen um, and um, uh, establishing uh, a record that can be later. And they haul out various quotes from Joe Quonin mostly about there's, you know, the, the promise that baseball will never leave Seattle. Uh, you can count on us, da, 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 da. So that is beginning to look very bad and the Sorianos and William Daly decide that the only way they are going to be made whole financially 
is to go into bankruptcy court. This takes everything completely out of the hands of the American League. Uh, the bankruptcy referee, as they were called at the time, the bankruptcy referee's duty is to make sure that as many of the creditors as possible are fully paid. This has, the American League is not a creditor. Um, and so their du his duty is to get the best deal for the creditors that he can. And the best deal had already been established. Milwaukee interests were willing to pay 10.8 million dollars for the franchise. And so with barely a week left in spring training, uh, the, the team is going to Milwaukee. The uh, semis that are carrying all the equipment from Arizona to Seattle have to be stopped in the middle of Utah or someplace and reroaded to go to, Mil uh, to Milwaukee. And these are the kind of headlines you get. This is actually from the Racine paper, but uh, all of the papers in the area were running uh, similar kinds of headlines at the time. And the Milwaukee Brewers, the, the American League, Major League Milwaukee Brewers are born. And that's it. That's, as I said, it's, it, this is from the book. So let's get out of this. This and I am happy to take any questions you might have. Dennis? That was very good. Can, is, um, can you forward me a copy of this PowerPoint? So if anybody wants it, they can reach out to me and I'll share sure. that with them. Yeah, right afterwards. Yeah, that would be perfect. I appreciate that. Um, very, very, very interesting. It's, uh, <laughs> I, I'm not to that far in the book yet, so I can't wait to read it as well. So, because uh, it'll be more detailed. Questions out there? I think, let me see if there's any questions out there on the chat. I have, uh, I have a question. Go ahead, please. I just wanted to know how long did it, did it take them to become solvent? As far as the between everybody declaring bankruptcy and things not going uh, right. Well, the ten point eight million dollars pretty much cleared up any problems that uh, all the creditors had, and uh, it's not completely clear to me, but it looks like the Sorianos, in the long run, at least broke even on the deal. But that was all because of the money uh, coming in from Milwaukee. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Andy. Yeah, Bob. Um, I know a lot. A lot I, I know financing is so much different now as opposed to, um, um, you know, fifty-five years ago or fifty years ago. Say, you know, we had by the '80s we had finance, the you know, finance capitalism coming into ownership. But, um, you know, it, it, it's so um, amateurish almost in the way it was handled. And I'm curious if the American League or Major League Baseball um, enacted any, um, you know, accounting oversights or um, 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 controls, um, you know, um, regarding ownership um, af after this, uh, this move. Yeah, that, that would come about in the 70s and the, and the 80s, uh, greatly in response to this episode, that uh, they began to um, look much more closely at the credentials of people who were looking to buy uh, major league teams. One big factor was when uh, Lee McPhail replaced Cronin as the president of the American League. And McPhail was a, a very organized and thoughtful guy. And he, uh, for the first time, American League owners, when they were considering expansion, would receive uh, packets that outlined uh, the financial resources of the people who were interested in buying the team, but also information about the market in general. What was the population of the city? What was the metro area population? What was the income levels in that city? What were the possibilities for, for advertisers and season tickets? So they began to have, they insisted upon after this debacle that they were going to have better information to, uh, to consider when new ownership groups were brought in. It was, I mean, yeah, I think you're seeing in 69 with, with the pilots especially, you are seeing uh, the last gasp of kind of 
amateur management of baseball. Uh, and when you then you will begin to see a much more professional management in the 70s and the 80s. Uh, I noticed Anthony posted a question on, on chat, and I would say, yes, I relied extremely heavily on Mullen's book, and it's just terrific. It's called Becoming Big League. It's from the University of Washington Press, and it deals with the incidents I'm talking about, but also the, the years running up to that and uh, the years spent getting the Mariners and building stadiums. It's a terrific book. Yeah, Andy. Yeah, Andy. One one other thing. Um, I'm a little bit familiar, having spent a little bit of time in the Pacific Northwest in the um, late '60s, early '70s. Though I know that the economic situation in Seattle um, uh, was uh, rather rough uh, with uh, Boeing aircraft at that time. How much did that uh, uh, enter into um, uh, the problems in Seattle? I don't know that I can quantify that, Bob, but it was certainly wasn't effect. I was there uh, 72 to 74 myself when the famous billboard went up, you know, with, with the last person to leave Seattle, please turn out the lights. Um, you know, the Vietnam War had ended. All of that defense industry spending had ended. That had a huge impact on Boeing. Um, and so it was tough and undoubtedly ha that have an effect. But how much? I don't know. Some undoubtedly. Yeah. yeah. Alec has a question. Yeah, thank you. Well, I guess uh, you alluded to th this already, but I was thinking about like crony capitalism, or I guess as you may term it, Cronin capitalism that did not work. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I guess, you know, as with most things during the 70s, my question would be I mean, where's Bowie Kuhn in all this? And also, I guess when you talked about the franchise fees for each side of the American and National League, the disparate pricing, was that related entirely to attendance differences because television wasn't a big part of revenue at that time? Or like, what, what was the, you know, the underlier there, do you think? Well, I, I, attendance was one of the big underliers. And there was just the general perception that uh, the National League was better run that it had better markets, um, and that if you consistently look at the uh, at the franchise movements since the the first of those in the early '50s, which brought the Braves to Milwaukee um, uh, through the expansion era and the other franchise relocations, the National League had consistently made better decisions about what markets to go into, headlined by the Dodgers and the Giants moving to the West Coast. And um, they were clearly uh, better organized. I mean, you, you'd had um, in, in the years surrounding the pilots, you not only have the pilots debacle, you do have Finley moving and causing the, the problems that the league would have in, in Kansas City. A couple of years later, you have uh, Bob Short uh, giving up in Washington and taking his team to Dallas-Fort Worth where he quickly sold, sold off and made a profit as soon as he could. There were all of these signs that, that the, the American League was simply not as well run. And also, I think partially it was just that the National League had the confidence to say, we're worth it. We're going to charge you more money. And to know that the kind of people who wanted to own baseball teams were out there and were willing to pay that kind of money and the American League didn't have that confidence. Well, wasn't that also related to the fact that the Yankees won all the time? I mean, I feel like it was the Yankees and the Seven Dwarfs in the American League. And in the National League, you had the Braves, Giants, Cardinals, Dodgers, who all had good, you know, successes, right? And they had a brand. Yeah, the well, there, there's the Yankees... something to that. But, but by the late 60s, that was less so. I mean, the Yankees hadn't won a pennant since 64. Um, and there had been a lot of turnover among the winners, you, I mean, you, let's see, you had the you had the Twins, then the Orioles, then the Tigers, uh, then the uh, who won in '69? The Orioles uh, came back in '69. So you had a, a number of different teams uh, taking that. The Yankees weren't as dominant as they had been, although in the period earlier in the '60s and definitely in the '50s, there was exactly what you were talking about, and the American right. League. 
But I think the fandom, though, is generational, right? It's a question of, you know, is there 40 years of success, right? Because people, older people like us, I mean, I, I think it's one World Series championship is not going to build a whole depth of, of affiliation exhibit Marlins. Uh, it has to be like a series of things that, you know, grandparents remember and parents remember, really, to me, to be foundational. Yeah, I, I think there, there, there's a, a good deal to be said for that. But, um, you know, I mean, it's not like the Yankees were a particularly well-run franchise off the field. In, in fact, in, in this period that I'm talking about here, they were making uh, some rather severe efforts to improve their public image, which they felt was very, very bad and discouraging people from going to the stadium. Um, so, I mean, there, I think, you know, there, there's definitely a strong kernel of truth in what you're talking about but it's not the absolute answer. Fair enough. Thank you. Okay. Peter, you have a question? Yeah, I do. Andy, great presentation as always. Thanks, Peter. Um, I'm currently reading Becoming Big League and um, in preparation for reading your book. And uh, one question I have is, William Daly was part of the Cleveland ownership group in 64 mm -hmm. that came out and looked at Seattle. And yet he, in 68, he ends up with 47% of Seattle ownership. So, what was the transition there? Surely the American League didn't let him uh, have ownership in two clubs at the same time. No, he had he had sold out. He'd gotten discouraged in Cleveland, as, as so many Cleveland owners would. And he had eventually uh, sold out mostly to, it, it was, a, there were a lot of pieces of the ownership group, but it was in effect uh, now controlled by Gabe Paul. But Daly had gotten out of ownership by that point. All right, good, thanks. Francis, you had your hand up before. Uh, yes, I did have it up, Dennis, but uh, Andy answered my question because it was pertaining to the uh, quality of the people running the or the uh, franchises in the two leagues. And Andy explained about the reasons beyond the fact that the National League simply had better cities that you went to, but also the quality of the people who were making decisions. Um, I, let me jump in because Alex uh, on the chat asked another, uh, I think, good, good question here. Both the Indians in 1964 and Finley, who had looked at Seattle as well as Oakland before he moved, and he actually liked Seattle better as a market, but both he and the Indians balked at Six Stadium. They just felt they couldn't do it in Six Stadium and evidently felt that the city was not really ready to step in and, and devote the kind of money that was needed to, to make the transition. Um, I, I would point out that, that we had at that point, um, there were stadiums which had been, I mean, we hadn't, first of all, we hadn't had a major league stadium built from the ground up since Yankee Stadium in the early 20s. In the, in the 50s, when those three teams moved, 53, 54, 55, they basically all moved to refurbished, municipally owned minor league stadiums. Um, mm. And then in, the, in 1958, you had a real dichotomy between what happened. The city built a stadium for Horace Stoneham and the Giants. And Walter O'Malley built a stadium for the Dodgers in Los Angeles. That would be the only privately financed stadium built between Yankee Stadium and uh, the new Giants Park in the 90s. Everything else during that period was being built by cities, four teams. And Seattle was reluctant to do that. And the Indians and Finley perceived it. And the Indians backed off. Finley went to Oakland. Yeah. Um, Andy, here in Milwaukee, in Milwaukee, the county stadium was a brand new stadium. It was not a refurbished stadium. And it was built for the Milwaukee Brewers minor league team with the hope of attracting a, a, uh, okay. a, a, a national league team. So, All right. Thank you, Dennis. Yeah. Um, question. After the problems the National League had with the Brewers, I mean, they probably weren't going to touch them ever after suing. 
did the American League have any trepidation about going back to going to Milwaukee? They had a major league station a stadium, the problems they didn't have in Seattle, but did they have some concerns with going to Milwaukee? Yeah, I think they had some concerns, but it was to, as soon as that club went into the bankruptcy court, the American League lost all control. Yep. Um, and the people who were coming forward with the money were the Milwaukee group. Now, yeah, I mean, they had great benefits. They had County Stadium. They had a, a city that wanted Major League Baseball. They had a good, strong ownership group who could take it on. Uh, but you, I have to think that the American League was worried. I mean, these same damn people sued us a few years ago or sued the National League. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think they had to have some, some concerns. There's a comment I just do anything about it. Yeah. Uh, Anthony Salazar has got a, a neat comment out here. Just a comment that here in Seattle, there's still a strong sense of a pilot identity as locals remember going to games and feeling major league. It's yeah. kind of cool or pretty cool, he says. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. yeah. As I said, I, I was living up there 72 to 74, and you still saw a lot of people in uh, in pilots' hats and, and they talked. Uh, um, you know, uh, reminiscent about uh, about the pilots and hopeful that another team would show up. But the papers were at that point all full of the full of the lawsuits of the, the city and the county and the state against Major League Baseball. And one of the interesting things is that Mullins points it out in his book. By the end of this, by the time Major League Baseball promised to create the Mariners, Seattle was so distrustful that they wouldn't drop the lawsuits. They, they, they negotiated this agreement with Major League Baseball that the Mariners would come and they would drop the lawsuits, but they didn't drop the lawsuits until the day the Mariners actually played a game in Seattle. That was, <laughs> that was the level of distrust that had built up. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah, um, and Andy, this is Stu. First of all, thank you for pointing out what a complete putz Bob Short was. Um, <laughs> he's he's from our state, and I was too young to remember him moving the Lakers. But I lived, in, and you had mentioned too that he was with the Democratic Party, uh, and uh, so am I. <laughs> but and so are a lot of other people who hated the guy i mean and that was just something else so that more than he could really get into the book but uh you know he took that team in washington when it was starting to get decent and so what but it's more i i remember 1970 i remember the night i was coming back from an our stars game finally getting the word that milwaukee's getting a team and it's amazing to think that they're going to be playing in six days although before i was born um the other Milwaukee team had moved in only a couple of weeks before the season. When you were talking about how they had to reroute the trucks that were coming up from Arizona, is, is that why Milwaukee just ended up with its spring training in Arizona? I mean, I guess they could have moved over the years, but it would have seemed more likely they'd be a Florida spring training team. Do you know they just kept it there? It was there with Seattle. No, I, and they were I, just I, I, I never looked at that issue, Stu. That's <laughs> interesting. Uh, that, that there was a, a possibility that would have gone to Florida, but I, I really don't know. Tempe, might have been... Diablo, Tempe Diablo Stadium was, was built for the, uh, uh, for the Seattle Pilots, uh, as, as my understanding. Oh, wow. Yeah, that makes sense. It might have been a contract or something they had to fulfill. Yeah. yeah. So, although bankruptcy could have killed that too. So, hey, I'm glad they went to Arizona personally, but you know, like, <laughs> For those of you who don't know, I live in Arizona. Yeah. So the president of the Wisconsin chapter lives in Arizona. That's still, uh, I think, uh, kind of that's a hint. I, and I and yeah, and I think uh, and I think Barry probably lives closer to Wisconsin than I do. So who's the yeah. president of the Arizona I'll, chapter? I'll, I'll tell you something else about Bob Short because he he plays into the book as well. He uh, when the Giants were uh, about to move in the early seventies. They were uh, supposedly going to go to Washington, D.C. Um, the, the, uh, the, the mayor uh, he came up with uh, uh, a guy, um, Bob Lurie, who was willing to pay for half of the team, but he wanted a partner. 
uh, who would take on the other half of the team. And he contacted Short, and Short agreed to be that other partner. Um, and so then Lurie went to the National League for approval of this arrangement. And the National League said, no, we are having no point, no part of Bob Short uh, unless he is a completely silent partner and you are the guy that we deal with and you make all the decisions for the franchise. And when Short heard that, he just backed out. He was, he said, I'm, I'm the guy who knows how to run a franchise, which was demonstrably <laughs> not true. <laughs> and uh, so he backed out and Lurie eventually found another partner and yeah. kept the team in San Francisco. But Bob Short's ugly head kept uh, rearing itself. Um, before we, before I forget, Andy, would you pick a number between one and thirty-three so we know who's going to get a copy of the book sent to them? Twelve. Tommy Davis's number. Tommy Davis. Mr. Beagie. Bob Beagie. Oh. Wow. Is Bob on here? Yeah. Oh, there he is. Hi, Bob. <laughs> Bob, I know I asked you this before, and Dennis brought it up in the stadium. Um, because County Stadium was well underway as a double-deck stadium, and uh, before maybe the twinkle of uh, the Boston National League team was there. And if, if I recall, you had said they really were building it for the Brewers. Obviously, they had to get something after Borchardt Field. But uh, was it with the thought in mind of trying to attract a major league team? And Bob, you're Dennis, on mute. Dennis, I think you know more than I do about this. And Bob, Bob you're, you're on mute. Yeah. Uh, I can't unmute him at this end. Bob, can you hear? Or, there we go. I can we go. hear you, but... Yeah. Uh, now we can hear you. Now you're good. Okay. All right. Well, what I was going to say was that the, uh, the Brewers had interest in a new park. Uh, certainly starting when Perini took over the, the Brewers, the minor league club. And I don't think they thought initially that they'd be able to get um, a, a ballpark built. They had had problems even finding a location. Um, they ended up building it on a, a, a dump, literally. And uh, there were a number of sites that they investigated, but there was some concern that even that would not go through. Milwaukee's always been very slow to accomplish things. They've been talking about a new ballpark since 1919. So uh, I don't think anyone had high hopes initially, but what they had was a really supportive fan base. And uh, the numbers were not, you know, overwhelming, but they were very loyal and there were people who had influence who uh, had the ear of people who could get something done. Anyway, all of this is uh, simply to say that um, Milwaukee built County Stadium, uh, noticeably called County Milwaukee County Stadium to make clear that this was public money. And um, they built it with a, the, in the back of their mind, certainly that maybe they could get a major league team, but they were prepared to open uh, in 53, um, as a minor league park, they, uh, they guaranteed, in fact, that that's the word they used, that it, the uh, ballpark would open um, with, the, with the Brewers playing there. And of course, once they got a, a whiff of the major leagues, everything else went out the window. They would have dropped the whole season for the Brewers if they had to. But um, anyway, the the fact that it came together and Milwaukee got a, a team is pretty amazing. If you look at the amount of uh, the acrimony that was there when the team left, um, it's amazing they ever got a, a team after that. And Bud Selig talks about that all the time. Six days. We had six days, he says, over and over and over. And it was pretty amazing. But um, anyway, they were set for a minor league ballpark that would seat 28,000, which was an enormous size. And then they added about 8,000 more 
soon after opening day, they put in temporary seats and, uh, and they were off and running. <clears throat> yeah. By the way, hello, Stu. Yeah, good to, good to see you. Yeah, I mean, yeah. The, and they built a, a, a double deck stadium too. You know, the, the New York Giants had purchased land in outside of the Minneapolis city limits with the intent of building a ballpark. And this is in 1948. They never, they never built it, and I've never figured out the reason. It wasn't the Korean War, which is a convenient excuse given. But um, I always think the history could have been different here. Maybe they, uh, they, they would have gone after the Philadelphia team, uh, which went to to Kansas City, if they would have even had a stadium with more than 10 to 12,000 seats as they would have and our our histories uh, might have been different but uh, then and the county stadium was completed during the Korean War but uh, I think the National Production Authority was granting exemptions to stadiums that were already under construction right mm -hmm. Andy Andy for the record, the Giants were slated to go to Toronto in 1977, not Washington. Um, sorry, no, they, there was talk that they were going to go in 77. You, in 74, 73, 74, it was Washington. In 77, there was talk of Toronto. And then in the early 90s, there was talk of Tampa Bay. Um, and it, it took a while for all of that to really settle down. It, uh, it was more than it was more than just talk. They were ready to go to Toronto, and 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 Bud Herseth was the guy who saved it at the last minute when Short bailed. That would be a Bud. Bud Herseth is a fascinating guy. I mean, he he had no connection to baseball before he walks up, and. Uh, Hans Lurie, you know, multiple million dollars says, don't worry, you run the team. I'm just going to put in the money. And a couple of years later, Lurie's able to buy him out. He comes and goes and barely raises a ripple in baseball. But is it is important in keeping the Giants in San Francisco? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Can a ball club succeed? In a ballpark with a name like Six Stadium, isn't that a self-fulfilling prophecy? <laughs> I just asked about the apostrophe. I threw that in the chat. That was Amel Six, plural S I S C K S. But the stadium had the apostrophe after the K. Is that right? No, as, as I understand it, his name was Sick. It was singular. okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, you, 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 I will also tell you, Stu, that I've seen virtually every possible variation <laughs> of that. Well, I was living in Seattle. I was living in Seattle back at the time when they had the minor league PCL team, and he was his name was Emil Sick, singular. The okay. stadium was Six Seattle Stadium because he named after his family. So. Uh, the apostrophe, I'm not sure about. I don't. Uh, I don't remember that it had an apostrophe back then. Well, if it was after the K, then it does. It is proper. The grammar geek and me will settle down. <laughs> <laughs> if there's no further questions, I would propose that we. I'm going to end the recording. And we're going to go to a session we call here in Wisconsin called Bar Time. And uh, it's really, we, our old chapter meetings when we were live, we spent more time at the bar, I think, sometimes than in the chapter meeting, talking baseball or other stuff. So I would propose, unless there's <laughs> another question, of ending the recording and going into bar time for anybody who wants to talk baseball. One Any last time, one last time, please, uh, uh, the title of the book, Andy? That's called Stumbling Around the Bases. It's from Nebraska. Uh, the subtitle is The American League Mismanages the Expansion Eras. Thanks. You can find it on Amazon. I bought it from uh, them not Great. too long ago.
buy more. <laughs> Thrift books might have uh, a used copy, and they're a lot less expensive. Mm -hmm. Oh, support the author. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I, <laughs> I, I although All I got mine. Well, books I, were new. I got mine free because I did a review of it. So, but I hope the review might spur yeah. something too. Andy, I want to thank you for uh, giving a terrific presentation here, and I'm looking forward to your books. Well, thank I'm you, Bob. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. I've certainly enjoyed yours. And uh, uh, if you guys are going to break up, the uh, the author's wife is telling him the dinner is ready and to get his butt in there. Okay. So. <laughs> okay. Well, we can do that. Andy, thank you. Um, I thank knew you, Dennis. I've known for years that your presentations are always ones we have to go see at the convention. So having missed it, I thought I needed this here and I knew it would be wonderful. And, and, and it was, a, it was why we have, I think this is the biggest Zoom meeting we've had just for our chapter. So thank you very okay. much. Well, it was great. And it was great not to be limited to 20 minutes. I'll tell you that. Uh -huh. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> having done that, I agree. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks a okay. lot. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you.